Okay. Uh, and send me your websites, uh, Jordan, because I should be putting those in the in the description for these videos. Oh, certainly. Yeah, but not here. Send them by email. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll just uh, let's just wait for a moment. We are online, and uh, we'll see if we. Okay, we've got a couple people watching now. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me uh, announce and make certain everybody knows that um, uh, this will be the last Sunday session for at least two weeks. Um, I am uh, giving up that part of my body which has died, which is my left hip on Thursday. And so I'm going to be uh, in recovery uh, from that surgery for a couple of weeks. And uh, I won't be able to conduct this Sunday session. The Monday and Wednesday um, sessions, which are uh, involve a lot more panelists, uh, will be conducted, but they will be conducted by others. So after tomorrow, the Monday session uh, is going to be led by Nick uh, Lawrence, at least for a week. And the, the advanced reading group session, which is our, uh, on Wednesdays at 1 p.m., will be uh, led by Tim Holmes. And so, uh, we look forward to seeing you. I will be turning those sessions on, but I will be in and out, I suspect, because one of the strictures of having your hip replaced is you have to keep walking or you end up with a embolism. So not good. <laughs> do my best to keep walking and moving. Um, good morning, Art. Nice to see you. Um, and, uh, so, uh, I'm here with Jordan Hoggard at, on our Sunday morning uh, Q&A. We're happy to answer any questions you might wish to put about um, Ezra Pound or C.G. Young. Um, and um, we're gonna be talking about uh, selected letters uh, of Ezra Pound, uh, 1907 to 1941. That's one book. Uh, are you going to pull anything from 76? Yeah, I'll we'll start with um, from 76 on the second, is the third paragraph of the page. The first paragraph is a completion of a previous page paragraph. And then on what it page? starts with page 26. Oh, 26, okay. All right. Uh, wonderful. Okay, so we'll start with that, and then we're then I'm going to briefly discuss this book, The ABCs of Reading by uh, Ezra Pound, which is quite an interesting uh, volume. He did a lot of writing in his career. So, uh, Jordan, you want to go ahead and start start us off here? Yeah, definitely. And then um, to humanize this paragraph too, um, you might mark. Um, page 13 of selected letters, the one in the middle of the page to Harriet Monroe, page London, 30. December. All right, should we read that first? I think let's read that one second um, because okay. it's interesting. This one in 76 struck me um, as important from a Jungian perspective to take it out of context. And okay. not so much to know what they were referring to, but to bring it into the psychology of how Ezra Pound aligned with young and depth psychology. Right. Okay. So we're on page 26, 20, 26. Of, of this book, 76, yes. One World, uh, and, and the Contos of Ezra Pound by Forrest Reed, uh, published by University of North Carolina Press. Um, Chapel Hill. Uh, so go ahead. Uh, okay, starting with the paragraph that begins, each symbol is a whole. Go ahead. Each symbol is a whole, 
Each symbol is a phase of an evolving four-phase whole, and each symbol metamorphoses its predecessors into new constituents and a new form. Taken together, these several aspects account for drafting by concurrent voices while drafting and building by sequential voices, so process and sequence. Another characteristic of this simultaneity is the unfolding and accruing four-phase subjects draft by draft as the overall revolution is being drafted and built toward the culminating four phases. Pound called this characteristic changing mass relations, quote unquote, mass relations. It is symbolized by an open-ended mount ended in ideal light rather than in stone. And it is announced by a concluding voice that keeps celebrating the same divinely favored beginnings from the vantage point of new endings. Quote unquote, mass relations are changed by adding a new subject to the previous four phase subject so as to form a new four phase subject. In the first draft, which contains evolving epitomes and prototypes for the whole poem, quote unquote, mass relations change by the addition of cantos. From that basis, mass relations change by the addition of drafts. Detailed exposition of this unusual form, especially in the first draft, will have to await closer examination. Here, it can only be sketched. Hey, there's and I a lot in that. Oh, yeah, yeah it, it's right. And it's felt so quaternity, fourfold alignment with the four psychological functions, the right. process and sequence of Jung, where there was a concurrence, I think, an alignment between Pound's process and Jung's work there. Right. And, and I'd want to draw the audience's attention to the idea that is contained in the Myers-Briggs and the four main functions in the Myers-Briggs. We'll, we'll come back to that, but go ahead. I was saying the comments from you on, on that. Well, I mean, what comes to mind immediately uh, from this and we uh, a couple of things that came to mind first the the in quotes mass relations obviously sounds like the collective unconscious um and um and i uh, what came to mind immediately was the theorem of uh, maria uh, maria prophetessa mm -hmm. and uh, so let me go back to that because that is about process and I have a easy way of understanding it, um, which you know indicates what the four things are and the symbol itself. Um, and so the um, the theorem of Maria Maria Prophetessa lived in the third century. She was a very early alchemist, and her theorem was one becomes two, two becomes three three becomes four, which is one again. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that is the essence of all alchemy. It is the essence of human life. And in, it's the essence of all change. And um, people have not understood alchemy because they think it's making gold when in fact it's making, uh, the self, uh, right. which is uh, the philosopher's stone, the, the Phileas uh, Philosophorum, right? Yeah, and um, and so my my very simple example, which everybody can understand, is um, when you're born into the world, you're alone, and then uh, you tend to take a significant other. Uh, a man finds a woman. So one becomes two, that's a couple. Uh, two becomes three, uh, which is a baby, okay? Which then we call it a family. And, which, right. And then the family is uh, also instantly a fourth thing, uh, which is, uh, basically a one again it's also it's both 
uh, it's both the third thing, which is the family, and the family itself is a symbol for for everything that's gone before. And now that's a one again. So now maybe you have a second baby. And so it's the family against the second baby. The second baby is the other, the um, and has to find its way into the family also. Uh, so in human relationships, it's very common for, uh, you know, a two-year-old to be very, um, jealous of a baby uh, because they've had mommy's attention all along, but now there's a four, now there's another baby and that baby's getting all the attention and the, and the new child goes, oh, wait a minute, this, this, I don't like this. <laughs> and and uh, so then the, the second baby has to work in. So, the, so it's uh, an individual, becomes a couple, the couple becomes a family and the family and the family is then a fourth thing, which is a new, a new level up and we go levels up so that you could have many, many uh, things that way. And, and so the family can be a symbol of a man and wife and uh, one, uh, one child, or it can be a symbol of of a dozen children or whatever. But obviously that also relates to organizations. You join an organization and it changes the organization. So and he, uh, I had a mentor one time who, uh, who said, um, anytime we add or subtract a person in an organization, it changes the organization. And we don't know precisely how and wow, that's definitely true because, mm -hmm. um, you know, you just see that all the time in, in organizations where you're working, where if someone new comes in and either you're going to end up working for them or they're going to end up working for you one way or another. And, uh, you know, that align, I, I really liked your example of Maria Prophesett prophetessa of the one becomes two, two becomes three, three becomes four. And then at that quaternity, the wholeness, four directions, four becomes one again, that cycle of identity that's created. And to me, that aligns. I mean, I, I boiled my architectural and creative process down years ago to just, um, just the three key components of everything is n plus one because you have the components and then you have the whole and like you said if you remove something it's different so everything is n plus removal you know n plus minus one but what's interesting to me is then another concept i use is what i call ficp which is functionally interrelated component parts and that dials back to the maria prophetessa where then the four are functionally inter dependent component parts that are now a whole of an identity of that say family example you utilize right. and i think even then moving through uh to use the quaternity the four is a general identity maker a form giver um form builder actually it's it's not it's less an idea more of um, an implementation something has come into being that even say the sixth sense to me, ESP, intuition, creativity included, um, is to me not a thing. It's, it's the what five senses become when they're all synced up and orbiting seamlessly. Then you have the human animal where, you know, your ears tell you whole movies from a mile and a half over there and then back over here while you maintain the focus. So, um, I appreciate the Maria Prophetessa is the kind of um, that non enigmatic kernel. It's not hard to crack. It's very alive and you get the whole oak tree and the seed and then back to the seed. So it runs that whole cycle. Um, right. She's a, I'm really glad you brought her up. That's, and especially divine feminine. And, and then she's so early. We usually with alchemy deal with 14th century men and, <laughs> and, 
I, I laugh. It's, um, but you know, third century, that's not margin for error. That's, that's a thousand years before. <laughs> that's, right. that's, a thousand that's, years before and it's stuck. You know, yeah, it's, yeah, you know it's what stuck, else exactly. do you remember from the third century? <laughs> you know, from the right. first century. For the from the fourth century, we got the Bible, you know. <laughs> but, right, right. But from the third century, that's uh, quite something. And so, you know, to one add one last thing to that, then I think something I remember saying in the interview once. I said the Trinity is always a, a quaternity, because once you have the Trinity, you know, once it manifests, it's yeah. Once it manifests, that whole thing as one is then four rather than th the fourth. Yeah. So in every, in every group, there's a hidden invisible plus one being mm -hmm. the, that which is the group rather than the individuals composing the group. So I find that that keeps it alive and active instead yeah. of scalar numbers, one, two, three, four, this is that. Well, this is that plus the orbit of its identity that Magnet magnetically holds it together. Right. And um, we can go into, as we were talking about the Trinity, we can go into all kinds of things, but, you know, the Father is not a vis visible God. That Father is in a different place. Um, and uh, the Son, of course, is Jesus Christ, which is a ma uh, manifest form of God, and then the Holy Ghost, um, and the um, and Christ said um, it, when his disciples didn't want him to go to Jerusalem because they knew he was going to get crucified. Um, he said, I have to go so that the paraclete can come, so that the Holy Ghost can come, is what he was talking about. And, um, and so his point was that um, once the crucifixion had been executed, um, the Holy Ghost would enter into all of his followers. And that makes the fourth thing, which is the Christian, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Well, and, that and also and it's that, all and it's also a symbol of God. Yes, and it's the Paraclete and the the Holy Ghost. It's I think important to bring up then our hidden plus one element. That's a feminine force. The Holy Ghost is like faceless female or anima, the spirit, mm -hmm. that right. female which exists in every male. Which then, if you look from the other side of the window of the Trinity. It, it would be two women and the male, animus. And in that sense, you get the sacred sisters rather than the apostles who come in from the temple and then flip the Trinity. So I, I always find it a little interesting that we, we often look at things as they're not as they are, but as they are presented. So this Trinity is such an immutable, oh, it's up on the altar. you got to leave it alone. It's sacrilege to touch it. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm going to go over and flip it around. I want to see the other side. What's, you know, where did the author sign this thing, you know, and the kind of thing. And to me, that's just the, you know, the forensics in me that wants to know how's this thing operating, you know, that's kicking amazing. the tire, kicking the tires. But it, you, when you flip or take a photo reverse of the idea of the Trinity, you get two women and a man and and then that then to me balances it out so it's not such an immutable enigmatic impossible to crack kernel right and you bring it back into like the maria Lund maria louise von france you know, the living god of the of the trinity in motion rather than this catechismic which i find sounds a little bit like cataclysmic you know it's right. like the brings everything down into static stale fish scales so uh which reminds me so so for this group we should uh go back and refer to this uh, wonderful um wonderful exchange that went on uh because we're talking about the living god the exchange that came uh 
from between Marie Louise von Franz and uh, a theologian. Mm -hmm. And uh, this comes up in alchemy. We're studying this in the advanced reading group, uh, her book, Alchemy. And um, the person who's making the remark here is a theologian. And so he says, I think God has already given his unique answer in each case, Dr. Von Franz. That is where we differ. You think God has published general rules, which he keeps himself. And we think he is a living spirit appearing in man's psyche who can always create something new. Remark, within the framework of what he has already published, and Dr. Von Franz says, <laughs> To a theologian, God is bound to his own books and is inca incapable of further publications. That is where we lock horns. <laughs> right. And so, you know, the, the whole point here, uh, which I love, and, uh, is that, you know, unions are talking about the living God and, and theologians want to talk about a God that manifested 2000 years ago and hasn't changed <laughs> well you know it's interesting this time you read that it reminded me of a professor i guess first senior year in college so the fourth year of the architecture program where he had this stunning speech i mean just inspiring but i love the phrase you use you get decapitated when he finished you you are completely motivated you are absolutely running at, at the, just the right revs. All your gears are synchronized, but you can't move. <laughs> You're sitting there and all of a sudden he's scat, go, go do it. You yeah. know, and he had, he had to kind of wake up the room and, you know, you see the little, the little grin, you could tell he was pleased with himself, but you know, for good reason, but it feels like that with Marie Louise von France with a theologian where then she's going, yeah, that's fine. Church is over. Now get out and do it. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. instead of leaving it just at this millennial, double millennial long static, this is what it is and always will be. Yeah. The thing that will always be is life. And that's what gives that any meaning. Uh, yeah. What do you got there on YouTube? Uh, well, what I, uh, I don't have any questions yet, but, uh, I just want to emphasize here, and we can do it once more, and then I want to go back to the um, to the actual what's actually here. And while I'm looking for what I'm looking for, uh, we'll say that um, uh, the I, this is referring to the idea of the symbol, and so a symbol is something which you cannot. Um, in any way describe uh, it, it does it does not hold to um, to description and um, which brings up the uh, immutable concepts in the semiotic philosophy about that which comes down to its very essence nothing added nothing subtracted that's where it lives that's right. what it and, is and the point that um the point that Dr. Uh, Edinger made about Jung's work is that um, is that he writes each paragraph is basically a symbol, okay? And so he doesn't write a paragraph the way we write a paragraph in English. He considers he wants to get all the detail of his symbol or as much as he can into his paragraph. And so basically what Edinger was saying is that, that um, each Jungian paragraph, and that's why they're numbered in, in all of his publications or most of them. And the reason they're numbered is so that between languages and between uh, different editions. If somebody wants to refer to a paragraph, it's easy to refer to it. 
And so the paragraphs are numbered and the page numbers are not significant because those can change between languages and between publications. But if I refer to paragraph 87 or whatever it is, then you know that's, that's the one for all languages and all publications uh, and everybody can find it. And so, um, well, you know, in that sense, then every paragraph is a temple step. You can stop and turn around and have a completely different perspective from the one before and the one after. Right. And so um, I want to emphasize a symbol that Tim Holmes did, which was, um, okay, there was, there was Tim Holmes, the famous sculptor uh, who has done all these amazing things in his lifetime, like being the first American artist to have a solo <coughs> exhibition at the Hermitage in St. Petersburg, uh, which he did uh, 28 years ago. And, and so, you know, but all that and, and the Tim Holmes, who is, uh, you know, the, the, the right wing of the, um, Montana uh, Ballet and Logging Company, for example. He's a, it, it was a barbershop quartet that he and his brother put together at the end of college and they performed nationally for 38 years. They were featured on NPR and so on for their satire and so on. So, um, so there's that Tim Holmes who is a one symbolically he he is a one and there's skip who who came in from the the logo side from the executive side and who started a um, public company for example that skip also is something and then you put it together and there's the two of us and then tim introduced this to me by sending me a postcard. And uh, so this is uh, Returning the Nails, which is one of his sculptures. And that this one sculpture changed me dramatically. Okay, it's a, it's a symbol of that change. And uh, what this sculpture is, is a image of Mary, mother of God, returning the nails to the Roman authorities. Now, when Tim sent that, that postcard to me with this image on it, it entirely blew me away. I, I couldn't, I really couldn't move uh, for an hour, as you were discussing earlier, Jordan, because the implications of it are so monumental that, um, you know, my mind was just going zip, 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 zip. <laughs> and, and I literally couldn't get out of my chair or, or think of doing anything else except looking at this thing. And of course, one could say, oh, well, Mary never returned the nails. There's no evidence of that. Um, and the truth is that uh, it did happen at least one time in history, and that was in the psyche of Tim Holmes. And, and therefore it is true, it is a fact, it is a psychic fact that he had this idea and he, he manifested it twice. There's actually two sculptures, uh, a little bit different each one, and he's actually conjured a third one. Um, but in terms of Maria Prophetessa now, um, we have the original one was Tim, two was Skip as a, a couple who are interested in the work of one another because Tim came from pure Eros side and I came from the pure Logos side. And all of a sudden we found common interest and Bango, then he shows me this sculpture and, you know, it just opened up an entire side of my personality and made it so 
wow, I want to do things with this man because this man um, is expressing something that I want to express but was never able to express. And that is that these nails represent the logos, the manifest world. And Mary, although she wasn't happy about the death of her son, is going to carry the future with her because his spirit will go on living. And uh, so the implications of it are just enormous. And so um, that sculpture was the third thing that manifested a fourth thing now, which is a, is a very uh, bonded brotherly friendship between me and Tim that, that is very strong. So anyway. Um, well, and that's important there, I think, too, to the, even then ex the backstory on the re Mary, you know, the returning of the nails. Um, also, then Mary, the divine feminine, <clears throat> giving up the masculine, refined, made, produced technology of the iron that has been forged into nails back to the process. She's throwing that back into the, the creative wellspring to basically smelt it, melt it, you know, melt it down back into the creative and then the divine feminine steps in. So that's very much to me, the authority of the Mary divine feminine saying, yes, but not yes, though. Yes, but here's your technology back, but life and art support our culture, not these nails, these. So she's basically removing and basically, I think it's alchemically the distillation. She's removing the precipitate of the technology of the nails right. to then supplant and implant the divine feminine more fully in that sculpture, too. Yeah. And um, so as long as we're talking about what what the what things came out of it, um, many things have come out of it. As anybody who has followed this channel in the last couple of years knows and you might want to go and listen to the interview between Tim and me uh, that occurred uh, in September, October, September, I think of 2019, uh, which you can find on the, on the uh, homepage of the YouTube channel. Um, but that when we did that interview, um, it took me four days to get it published because there was so much in it. And in that four days, <clears throat> in that four days, I felt as if I had lived with Tim as my brother for 30 years. Okay. It's, and I've sometimes said, it's like, um, it's like the scene in Star Trek where John Luke Picard has this little thing that looks like a, I don't know, a tube, a silver tube. And he's on the bridge of the enterprise and suddenly there's this flash and he's put on another planet and he can't escape. And he lives 30 years on this other planet, has a wife and three children. And he learns about how he learns among other things, how to play the flute. But a lot of things during the program uh, happen on that planet, of course. And then at the end of the show, bang, he's flashed back and he's only been gone for 30 seconds. But in the, in the imaginal realm, he had lived 30 years. Right. And, uh, and the proof of that was he could play the flute still, you know, when he mm -hmm. came back to, um, the, to uh, the enterprise and, so that was the essence of my feeling when I interviewed Tim and we did this zip, 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 zip uh, interview back and forth that um, it was kind of like that. Uh, so anyway, carry on. Well, I was going to say that that then applies. I think let's, let's go to the letter number 10 to Harriet Monroe. Is I think this the dialogue that you're referring to that was the form giver of all this with, between you and Tim, and same kind of uh, mode of being, as it were, with uh, with 
Ezra Pound, and it, <clears throat> page 13, letter number 10, London, December. Dear Miss Monroe, yes, the quote unquote related things is more to my fancy. I had no intention of trying to exclude you from your own magazine, but you know as well as I do that you could have written the Nogi, Nogi in four lines if you'd had time to do so. I've sent the $30 to Tagore. For Gord's sake, don't print anything of mine that you think will kill the magazine. But so far as I personally am concerned, the public can go to the devil. It is the function of the public to prevent the artist's expression by hook or by crook. Ancora e ancora. But be sure of this much, that I won't quarrel with you over what you see fit to put in the scrap basket. I am, however, sending you a series of things herewith which ought to appear almost intact or not at all. And footnote one there, the series of things he refers to were additions to the contemporanea poems. So given my head, I'd stop any periodical in a week. Only we are bound to run five years anyhow. We're in such a beautiful position to save the public soul by punching its face that it seems a crime not to do so. P.S. Yes, do check out that last one or the last one, whichever it may be. It's probably very bad. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, there's an encapsulation of that whole process there where the given, he's, he's administering the give and take including her perspective in the conversation as he's going forward. So he's not in this soliloquy monologue disconnected. Um, you can tell there's very much a vibrant connection between them. And right. he's listening to her and at the same time, just keeping it so fresh there and keeping it real, real. Yeah. And you can see, I mean, I can see the, the Ezra pound business owner, the driver, there um but who's empathically also listening to her you know so he doesn't lose he doesn't really care about authority he he lo he doesn't it's not about control it's not losing authority of the mission of what he's doing and the mission of what they're all doing together right. so that he's he's not afraid to make you know amputation level cuts and it's about the health of the system. So in that sense, you know, that he never met an institution he didn't like, I think as you said last week, um, that, that kind of comes in. He's, he's not going to limit himself to, um, I guess, as Alan Watts said, you have no responsibility to be the person you were even five minutes ago. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? Okay. So that, that, brings up i don't think i discussed this already my short-term me memory is dying but um i haven't discussed this yet in in our public conversation here so from that m those two moments with of me with tim which were transformational entirely transformational for me um you know both the returning the nails and the interview uh, we've now evolved to this, and this is the announcement about our uh, confluence uh, that we will be doing uh, next summer, uh, the 10th to the 14th of June, 2022, in Helena. I've talked about it uh, before. Uh, we'll be talking about it a lot more in the coming uh rest of the year until then. Uh, but anyway, this is a landing page that we've had drafted and uh, I'm going to, we're, we're going to make a few minor changes to this. Uh, for example, we're gonna lose the term visionary referring to Skip <laughs> and, and uh, because that would be, um, too prideful and inflation, inflated uh, to use that term. But in any case, uh, you can get a sense for what we're doing. And it's going to be an event 
that only 30 people will be ever be admitted to. And so it's a invitation only event. And if you think you might be interested in this to have an opportunity to rub shoulders with, with Tim Holmes uh, live and with these other uh, artists and visionary people, um, for renewal, which is what this is about, then you can write to me and I'm putting my email address into the YouTube channel um, chat. You can write to me and request an invitation and uh, then you will receive all um, more of the details about this event. But um, because it's invitation only, you're going to have to get your uh, your request in early <laughs> and and uh Jordan's different? already on the list but so there's only 29 seats left <laughs> yeah that was that first day I'm like okay portrait please <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you've been like what persona will you have next year <laughs> yeah that's right uh well this is the persona right here yeah uh, you've got be because uh, I'm going to among other things, we're going to do a play called The Rabbi and the Analyst, uh, which is uh, right here. I happen to have the script right in front of me because I'm trying to learn my lines. But um, uh, yeah, well, I have to. And the Rabbi um, and uh, Skip is going to play C.G. Young. And so I'm I'm trying to rock the image of C.G. Young. I yep. think I'm going to have to have weight, a little my weight makeup in my eyebrows and mustache, but that's why, that's why I'm growing the mustache in preparation for that. Well, it's funny that um, the weekend after you mentioned, so I wonder what persona you'll look like, have be wearing next year. I, you know, I laughed and, you know, I, I don't know. And at the same time, I went, oh, I don't know. And so I don't know. And then I had my photo shoot um, the next um, Saturday. I needed new headshots and some, you know, different characters, more living images. And um, I, I laugh. My, you, you told Tim, I didn't think about this till just now. You told Tim, I, I, you know, show me with a smile. And afterwards, I, I said, did you get any with a smile? She goes, you were smiling a lot, but I waited till you relax. <laughs> So, and she got one that I swear looks like I've just gotten out of a shootout at high noon. And just the look is nothing like I'd seen on my face before. And I laugh because that guy was going to go to the saloon after he shot up you know, the town. And but the reality was this guy was going to the salon to have my beard sculpted after the shoot. You know, I, I wanted it more rugged. So the joke became to the saloon or the salon? choices choices so <laughs> <laughs> why not do both you know yeah, so but so. the picture the picture was um very much when i look at the picture I'll, I'll send it to you um when i send you the website information too the picture was very much wow i better be kind to myself or that guy's gonna come hunt me down <laughs> you know and it's me and it's, yeah. and it's, and it's me so do, do you have that picture on your computer right now yeah, I do. Actually, you want me to, if you want me to share it, I'll put it's, yeah, let me it's quite, it it's so different. It, here. it was like, it was to me, it was the keeper. It's not going to be my new headshot, but it. Okay. You're co-host now, so you should be able to share it. Since you're talking about it, we might as well pull it out. Yeah. With persona it's. Um, So there you oh go. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I better read I, that guy's gonna come hunt me down if I'm not nice to myself. Oh my goodness. That's and then amazing. right afterwards, there's this, which right. is absolutely this, you know, happily, creatively pensive, joyful, calm. But this guy. <laughs> yeah, he's looking right through me. Um, yeah, and even got the got the snot in the eye because it's dusty and windy that day. And I mean right. it's but, I, I actually made Tim change his, his profile picture at one point because he had this kind of a look, which is a look right through you type of look. 
Yeah. And uh, it, it's actually quite intimidating that look. And um, <laughs> I laugh. I was, I was going through the pictures with a photographer and um, she came up on that one. I went, hello. <laughs> it's like, you know, that, that, cause the joyful, just looking up, oh, calm, pensive, creative, hanging out in the sun, looking up and look at this nice white beard and blah, blah, blah. And, that's such a quaint little photo. And, and I really liked that photo. And then she swiped and the next one, that next one came up and like, hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I get it that when Tim has that, has that look too, um, just right through you. And right. I, uh, let's see. Got to see if I can find it here. Um, I had um, yesterday, I had an interesting exchange um, with one of my lifelong friends, or actually the wife of one of my lifelong friends. And uh, it's about creativity and about um, manifesting something. But now I've got to find it because it's, uh, I, I think I hid it away from even me. <laughs> yeah. You know, something that just came up to me, even in the, in, in tandem with those those two pictures portraits I just showed uh, or just shared um, the concept you know Ezra, Ezra Pound when you add one thing the mass relations are completely changed it's another thing so honestly when I just added five seconds and a different thought it went from this guy's going to hunt you down to oh look at that guy in bliss. You know, I mean, so it, it, it was complete change because those those two pictures, I think, were taken, I think, in a span of five to ten seconds apart. I mean, yeah. it was. And so it's, it's amazing a complete to me change. I have to excuse myself yeah. for a minute. Sorry, that's fine. Keep talking. So Skip's going to pull up a picture um, that if he was able to find it when he comes back. And I guess this brings up just the idea of the symbol of persona and personality that is present at any given time. Persona typically indicating a dressed identity, like a dressed rather than addressed. Um, so the heart of the matter of the personality may be behind the persona, but the persona is either costume or congruent and fits the identity um it still could be costume in that sense and it's interesting persona or persona with an ae plural at the end can often um as we just saw in the pictures those were five to ten seconds apart that there was a complete mood change and a complete um even identity persona push change Whereas what was inside wasn't changed, but it was stirred differently. So that to me, that's interesting just to bring up the point of perspective with the persona. Something my grandfather used to say that if you're confused, just ask, how do you hold your mouth? Well, you turn your head, you have a different perspective when your eyes play that uh, telemetry game, like a plane turning. And I think that that comes then back to persona as to what something is presenting itself as at any given time and or in what mode is it currently driving, living, navigating. So interesting when Skip comes back into the conversation of persona to me, persona can often have a superficial or negative pejorative connotation. But at the same time, it just is what it is. And, and if you take the every day is Halloween with the pandemic, everybody's wearing a mask um, and maybe eating candy. I don't know. But that idea of everyone wearing a mask has changed such that the expression of mood often comes not from the smile on the mouth, but the, the mood of how the eyes present. So in a sense, just what's above ground. So um, I don't know, that brings up a concept of, you know, the, the words we use can, they root us, the, 
below the mask and the eyes are now the persona of expressing our mode and our mood. Yeah. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, just as I left the scene, uh, you said Skip's going to pull up and I, I, I didn't hear the end of the sentence. So tell me what the end of the sentence was. Oh, a picture he was looking for. No. <laughs> okay. Well, it's actually an image of a play. Okay. <laughs> but that's a perfect demonstration of a projection. Okay. In other words, um, Jordan had a projection of what I might pull up. So he described that as a picture. And uh, what I wanted to pull up is something else. With, uh, and let me give you some background first. Um, the, I have a friend from 1962. And, um, and so we've been friends. He, he's actually my dearest friend in life. And um, I actually lost him for 30 years because he went off the grid. <clears throat> um, during the Vietnam War, he, he went to Canada and never came back. And um, when I found him, he had um, he had become basically a mountain man, <clears throat> and he had married this amazing woman. Oh, amazing woman who was so creative, and. Um, and, you know, I can't really describe um, her in any special, I mean, it, it, to begin to describe her, I would have to describe the whole woman and, and you can't really know her at all unless you're physically in her presence. Um, and, um, uh, he is an extremely creative fellow. He, he made himself into being a biologist and he came up, he's come up with some innovative things. Uh, let me, I'll just give you sort of an order of magnitude. This is a, this is a Ray Green story. Ray Green and Penny Dwyer, uh, his wife. And Ray, um, oh, about 40 years ago now, um, was looking for a way to get Weyerhaeuser, the, the lumber company, to stop um, using pesticides in the forests of British Columbia. So he, he uh, explained to them that the only way the pests get on the trees is by climbing up on the... Um, on the grasses and stuff that are at the base of the tree. And if you could get rid of those grasses, um, then there would be no pest problem and therefore you wouldn't have to use pesticides. <clears throat> and uh, so he uh, invented this system whereby you take sheep and run the sheep through the forest <laughs> and um, and it became quite an industry uh, where uh, Ray gathered all the sheep in Western Canada, all the way over to Alberta and Saskatchewan. This is in British Columbia. He would bring them to British Columbia and he would basically line them up on the Southern border of Canada and have them mar march forward during the summer months eating all the, all the vegetation. And of course, if you're gonna have that many sheep, the farmers, or the, the shepherds, the farmers were happy to give up the sheep for the summer because they were raising sheep for wool. And so they would shear the sheep in uh, February, March, which is the customary time. And then Ray would basically rent them at five dollars a head I think uh, for the summer he would take them he would feed them all summer with the vegetation <laughs> in the forest and then he would return them back to the farmer at the end of the season 
But in order to do that, um, he, uh, uh, he had to, first of all, get wranglers who would, shepherds who would handle the sheep, who would herd the sheep along. And those guys live in Australia. So he would take the Australian sheep herders and import them to Canada for the summer. They would herd the sheep. Let's see if I've got all this. And then he had to, um, he had to also uh, import, um, obviously, border collies to, to nip at the heels of the sheep and guardian dogs. Now, guardian dog is a breed of dog that comes from uh, Yugoslavia. And so he actually started using these guardian dogs. And the unique, uh, the unique thing to protect the guardian dog, or to have the guardian dogs protect the sheep. And the, um, the essence of it is the guardian dogs look like a sheep. They're white and they look like a sheep. And whenever a predator came nearby all they do is bark they don't attack the predator but they scare him away <laughs> but ray put all this stuff together and and are those Penny, guardian are those guardian dogs uh, pyrenees great pyrenees the white i don't think they're great pyrenees i, I think it's a different breed because okay they were especially okay. bred for this purpose okay uh, um and uh so Ray had researched this and, and uh, gone through the whole nine yards. And so anyway, um, that's a long story. Ray tells us one story about how he was, he was sort of under this overhang and all of a sudden the sheep comes jumping out over the overhang above him, over his head and over behind the sheep, like this, is Penny, his wife, diving for the sheep <laughs> to grab it. <laughs> uh, and so, anyway, that that's a, a little sense of um, uh, that's a very small sense of what these people are. But they're they still live in northern Vancouver Island, and they're very special. So, yesterday. Um, I'm going to demonstrate a creative facet of Skip, which is yesterday uh, or over the last few months, Penny has taken an interest in presenting new words to the world. And so she has a, she has a list and every day on, uh, on messaging, she, she sends out a new word and describes what it, how, how, significant it is and what um what it means and so on and uh so she said there's there's only one word in the she said wrongly that there's only one word in the in the language which rhymes with canada and that is panada p-a-n-a-d-a -A. now she had one meaning for panada but I said, wow, with Canada and Panada, I bet I, I'll bet I can write a Bill and L about it. So <laughs> that sort of that sort of reminded uh, Penny of Villanelles. So she ended up writing two Villanelles. And then she said, so now I hear that's the Villanelle challenge, Skip. So now you have to write a Bill and L. Or, you know, she, I don't know if she said that in so many words, but I said, okay. I'll write a bill now. I'm I'm challenged, and I have to stop and do that. So here is uh, Skips, and what I discovered almost 30 years ago was that you can give me any topic. It's kind of a party trick, actually. You can give me any topic, and in 45 minutes, I can write a bill now on that topic without fail. And and show it to people. So anyway, here's here's my bill and how on Canada and Panada. And by the way, in, in my context, Panada means a kind of dough. It's 
It's a description of dough before it becomes bread. Okay, so um, so here's I like phyllo dough and actually a rising dough. Right. So here's here's Skip's Villanelle. Uh, Canada's Panada. Uh, Canada is a healthy Panada, diverse in its it as it is with many fine sights. No thought consumes the whole enchilada. You can't slice it with a cheap espada. It's not divided in provincial fights. Canada is a healthy panada. Some even come from Vijayawada, where spices in foods are the chef's delights. No thought consumes the whole enchilada. Russians covet the whole empanada uh, in tiny, quick, inconsequential sight. Uh, bites. Canada is a healthy panada. Her size repels a whole red armada. Uh, Mounties can stop even Calgary fights. No thought consumes the whole enchilada. Canadians know all threats come from, come to nada. Outside, outsiders who fight are soon in their sights. Canada is a healthy panada. No thought consumes the whole enchilada. <laughs> <laughs> well you know that brings to mind canada as the other switzerland you know because it it's it's one of those it canada is like a fighter who knows how to keep the jaw together so you don't break your jaw but keep the neck relaxed and so they could just sit there and take hits all day long but it's not really transferred any force so yeah. i mean Canada would just end up, you know, the fighter that just tires the other fighter out and then with one punch just finishes it. Yeah. So uh, good morning, Nancy. And uh, just in case, I, I think I better uh, I better go over to some of the comments on YouTube here. Oh, excellent. Uh, so I'll go back here to uh, comment neil said the first man just stormed congress is that a news story uh, neil or something we should be concerned about anyway nancy faff hi jordan uh hi jordan and then C C just in case says arg was occupied with vigo mortensen speaking about albert camus so i missed the start here <laughs> and, and, that's a good uh, occupation to be distracted by yeah, well, uh, it's nice to know that I have draw like Vigo Morgan, Morgan, Morganson. Uh, Morganson good, yeah, he's Morganson. he's a guy. He's yeah, he's he's impressive. Yeah. So hi, Justin, and then uh, first time on live, and I just want to say thank you, Skip, very much for all the readings, breakdowns, uh, talks. You're welcome. Justin says. Uh, brain podcast P splendid you finally found us live welcome uh, to the chat and wendigo says yum uh, they're referring to the tasty panada <laughs> <laughs> nice but not the whole enchilada <laughs> yeah i mean it, it, it's a bit of a witticism but uh also i i told penny that uh, she better be careful about my book, though. Um, and uh, and let's see. Uh, I just give you. A, I wrote a whole book of villanelles at one point in my pen name, and um, and I said uh, my book would create a riot in a in a nunnery. Uh, uh, to use the, the bard's terms. And uh, so my book is called, um, uh, what is it called? It's called um, Seduction of the Soul, I think. And uh, it's an entire book about the art of seduction uh, in poetry. And I just, and it's written under my pen name, which is David Gerritsen. And here is the, uh, it, here's the opening poem of that, just to give you a, a sense of it. It's called Symphony. I want to play you like a symphony, draw a rosin bow across your silken breast, 
with driving rhythms from the timpani. I'll guide you far from life's cacophony to hidden valleys, Mozart's sweet bequest. I want to play you like a symphony. Molten cello will conjure sylvan sea before brass cymbals bring the waves to crest with driving rhythms from the timpani. Oboes kiss the brass with breath so gently that woodwinds whisper lover's firm request, I want to play you like a symphony. Until our tension passes middle C, just one crescendo frees life's hurts redressed with driving rhythms from the timpani. Warm string vibrations guide infinity across our honeysuckle minds abreast. I want to play you like a symphony with driving rhythms from the timpani. <laughs> And so I said, as I said, it could cause a riot at a nunnery. <laughs> well, you know, what's interesting is that when you said that to cause a riot at a nunnery, I hadn't heard that and I don't know how long, but then, and I don't mean to be sex sexist by keeping this into like feminine institutions, nunnery, but what came to mind was to make a riot in a nunnery to make silence in a brothel. <laughs> <laughs> and Miles, Miles is here because I sent this panada poem to him yesterday. And he said, uh, there's a panada pizza in Nova Scotia. And panada, and just in case, says panada is very European too, mostly in the West and South cousins here in Denmark. We make it traditionally, it traditionally with rye bread. Uh, and uh, Miles uh, suggested that I send the poem to the uh, Panada Pizza people. And uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so anyway, let's we'll come back to our what we were talking about. But um, just in terms of we've been talking a bit about creativity and and how you can. You can be creative if you even half try. And, mm -hmm. and so, you know, once you learn uh, the basic form of a villanelle, for example, um, I, you know, I was basically a Luddite, Luddite on poetry, but um, at one point I decided I, I wanted to learn some of the secrets of writing poetry. So I took a a class from a fellow, I think it was like five two hour classes or something that he was giving. And, um, and he explained how, how to write a villanelle. So I went home that, that week and uh, I wrote, I wrote symphony at that time and brought it back the next week. And he said, well, you found your, your metier. <laughs> <laughs> which is definitely true so that I found not only could I write that one but I could write 50 of them and and publish them in a book called Seduction for the Soul by D David Gerritsen well and it's interesting too in in seduction um that you have timpani because if you look at how to write poetry and you're into forms i mean the villanelle the iambic pentameter uh sonnet etc there starts to be a percussive you know, drums percussion where you start to live the rhythm and then that's then the words get poured into the form that's musically established by that rhythm rather than forcing the words into a pattern so you literally start to play your words so play like a symphony even was to me even at another level a pun even on what was happening with the villanelle from a poetry form standpoint right and and there's actually another poem called symphony's reply but i won't uh, uh, and that too is a is a villanelle but i uh in the in the interest of good taste i'm not going to read that if you want to read that you have to read my book. <laughs> there you go. And uh, for them, just knows that my book is available for free in electronic form, but I'm not going to go into that now. So, 
anyway, uh, so I'm not I'm not proselytizing here. I I don't. I sort of gave up being a, a poet uh, years ago, and I'm doing other things now. But let's go back to your paragraph, uh, Jordan, and and take it apart. Sentence yeah, by, 76. Sentence yeah. by sentence, because it's an extremely powerful uh, paragraph. And yeah, very, very dense. In. Why don't so, I just read it like a, a sentence and stop? A yeah. sentence and stop. Yeah, please. <clears throat> so page 26 on 76, One World in the Cantos of Ezra Pound. The paragraph that's full, second paragraph, third one down. Each symbol is a whole. Each symbol is a phase of an evolving four-phase whole. And each symbol metamorphoses its predecessors into new constituents and a new form. Thoughts on that? Well, I, I think we've already been talking about that at great length, including... Um, you know, the symbol of the poems that I've just read as symbols of Skip as poet. Uh, and you can, you can be serious about it. You can be serious about poetry and learn how, learn how to do it in great detail. Or <clears throat> as I discovered, um, you know, with tongue in cheek, I could, um, I could write a villanelle on any topic in 45 minutes, which mm -hmm. is a kind of party trick. So it impresses people who have never seen me do it. But on the other hand, um, you know, it can end up being quite profound. <laughs> and, um, and so from the outside, it can seem quite profound. Uh, for me, I sort of, uh, after I, caused a couple of uh, riots and nunneries. <laughs> I decided I better move on to something else. <laughs> nice. So and so I, <clears throat> I metamorphosed from being a um, seductive poet into what I, whatever it is I am now. And uh, nice. And that's, uh, that's a matter of some debate, even among my closest friends. <laughs> Funny, funny. Um, I think yeah. I think you you enough when you brought up um, Maria Prophetessa, the alchemist from the third century. I think yeah. I, I'll just pour her back into and each symbol metaphor metamorphoses its predecessors into new constituents and a new form. And her creative process statement, living creative process statement, was the one becomes two, two becomes three three becomes four, and then four becomes one. So the, as each thing comes to a quaternity of four directions, four winds, it becomes another identity. So that's the cycle of four. Um, so maybe we pour Maria Prophetessa into this first sentence as just a sidebar. Right, and, and so um, symbols do change, and, and so even... Uh, the symbol of this physical body that you see here, um, you know, everybody's perspective about Skip uh, changed once when I read Canada's Banata and then changed again and evolved again when I read Symphony. Uh, and, and so this is, this is the essence of alchemy and what, what we're, we've been talking about alchemy for uh, weeks in, uh, in the advanced reading group. And so if, um, if you want to join the advanced reading group, <clears throat> please write, uh, write to me and say so, and I will uh, get you the information. Um, so, um, <clears throat> but alchemy is about finding the self, the soul, uh, and, uh, well, and the next sentence then speaks to alchemy, yeah. where taken together, these several aspects account for drafting by concurrent voices while drafting and building by sequential voices. 
Right. So um, just in our conversation here, we've uh, presented sequential voices. And here's another one uh, from just in case. As a Boy Scout, I often in early mornings made panada on a campfire, on the campfire, and the smoke taste is wonderful. And Miles says, beautiful simplicity, just in case. Camping, campfire, smoke, and a simple food. <laughs> right. And, um, and I, I demonstrated Canada's panada <laughs> earlier in my villanelle. So, right, right. Um, so, you know, the, I guess the object for finding one's soul and getting to the base of that, which is the philosopher's stone, which is finding the living God, mm -hmm. um, which Mary Louise von Franz was talking about, which the theologians have lost the meaning, um, you know, because they're constantly pushing something that early, early Iron Age men <laughs> came up with as an idea for what God was about. Um, you know, that's, it's a living thing and it, and it changes. Uh, well, I remember my dad would say, you know, in terms of the, you know, people who can do people who can't teach and he would just grimace. He goes, no, no, no. People who teach do it better. They can do both. But yeah. his thing was he would, you know, own that that was a valid distinction. But what it was, was he said, because too many teachers kill it when they teach it, you have to enliven it. You have to lineage. There's an oral story quality handed down in all creativity and all language. Yeah. And so to enliven it, but then his quote right after that would usually be something like, sure, it's true the way it happened, but it's more true the way I tell it. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. Because what but, happened is, you know, he had run it through the creative process. So once you pull it in, those facts become reference um, mile markers, but they don't tell you anything about the journey. They, you know, you completely change at any given time. Which my mother summed, summed it up this way she was a great storyteller, and uh, very often, somebody would say oh that's not true and my mother would say if it's not true it ought to be <laughs> oh nice that nice <laughs> okay let me uh, read the next sentence another characteristic of the sa simultaneity is the unfolding of accruing four-phase subjects draft by draft as the overall revolution is being drafted and built toward the culminating four phases. Okay. So uh, what he's referring to here is the fact that uh, Ezra Pound's cantos uh, were, were constantly changing. And in his mind, uh, they changed throughout his life. And so Reed, who, uh, Forrest Reed, who's the author of this book, is pointing out that if you go back to the drafts of the cantos, you can actually see the evolution of the cantos. So, Right, and I think it even uh, apropos to the season, Halloween, October, if you've been you know, in a fun house or a haunted house, and some, they have the strobe light. So what happens is you basically given images, or in this case, drafts. So, you know, when you, this paragraph can get a little lazy and boring by, wow, can you use the word draft like anymore? Okay, can you put that word in there anymore? But if I look at it visually, it's, it's kind of a strobe light of a paragraph where the draft by draft by draft, each image with a, sp a marked space between, there's a whole image missing between each image and it changes at each new iteration or draft. So this paragraph is kind of that strobe light of look at the pieces missing, pulling them apart, the panada, pull the bread apart, so that you can see the difference from literally one moment to the next. 
Right. So I happen to have a copy of the Contos here. I bought a used copy, which is in beautiful condition and so, so beautiful that I don't want to mark it up uh, because it's, it's basically scripture. Um, but uh, just to give people a sense of Pound's work, one of his most famous um, cantos is canto number 81. And, um, and halfway through it, uh, there's a passage which, for which he's quite famous. And I, I think I should read it just to give people a, a taste. What thou lovest well remains. What thou lovest well shall not be wrecked. Uh, the rest is dross. I'm sorry. Let me start again. I missed the end of a sentence. What thou lovest well remains. The rest is dross. What thou lovest well shall not be reft from thee. What thou lovest well is thy true heritage, whose world or mine or theirs, or is it of none? First came the scene, then thus the palpable Elysium, though it were in the halls of hell. What thou lovest well is thy true heritage. What thou lo lovest well shall not be reft from me. The ants, a centaur in his dragon world, pull down thy vanity. It is not man. It is not man-made courage or made order or made grace, pull down thy vanity. I say, pull down. Learn the green world that can be thy place in scaled invention or true artistry. Pull down thy vanity, Pockland, pull down. The real cask has outdone your elegance. Master thyself, then others shall thee bear. Put down, pull down thy vanity. Thou art a beaten dog beneath the hail, a swollen magpie in a fitful sea, sun, half black, half white, not, know, knowest, not knowest our wings from tail, pull, pull down thy vanity. How mean thy hates fostered in falsity, pull down thy vanity. Wrath to destroy, niggard in charity, Pull down thy vanity, I say, pull down. Put, uh, but to have done instead of not doing, this is not vanity. To have with decency knocked, that the blunt should open to have gathered from the air a live tradition, or from a fine old eye, the unconquered flame. This is not vanity. Here, error is all in the not done, all in the diffidence that faltered. So. All in the diffidence that faltered. Yeah. So here error is not in the not done, all in the diff, here error is all in the not done, all in the diffidence that faltered. So mm -hmm. in other words, he's saying, you know, get your ass in gear. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there's no mistakes. It's all OFL opportunity for learning. No. Yeah, it's all um, carpe diem. <clears throat> Let's see. Right. And, um, all right. So the next. Well, carpe diem, so you can carpe per diem. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> so anyway, I. Uh, Going to the next sentence, Pound called this characteristic changing mass relations, <clears throat> which I interpret to be the collective unconscious. Um, you know, and I, I agree. And I also look at the mass relations like planetary orbits. You know, one moves and it's a different scenario. Another moves, second later, different scenario. So the mass relations to me also go to architectural process. Every time another line is drawn, the thing is forever changed. Every time a line is removed, a thing is forever changed. Every time a wall, a footing, a special feature, a floor medallion, 
it's forever changed. So that strobing frame by frame through the process to me kind of dials into how to engage his concept of mass relations. And like you said, the collective unconscious and even how that's poured out into life piece by piece, moment by moment, archetype by archetype. Right. And this, this is uh, God's way, by the way. Um, so let me go into uh, the new God image by Edward Edinger. And um, there, there's a key uh, letter here that, that I often refer to. Um, which, you know, explains where Jung was. It's the only place I know of that he really put, put his cards on the table and told him what he was telling him about because he was very reluctant to be seen as attacking Christianity. His father had... Um, was a pastor and generation seven generations back i think and he had seven uncles who were pastors so he was very reluctant to criticize christianity and he was very reluctant to criticize other psychologists and something that he almost never did but there's one paragraph here it's on page 187 of um of the new God image, and it is also found in volume 18 of the collective works, which is called The Symbolic Life, paragraph 1664, 1664 paragraph. And uh, here it is. Although, although all this sounds, and by the way, he buried this at the end of a 10 page letter. <laughs> that he is writing to a, to a theologian. <clears throat> and he says, although, although all this sounds as if it were a sort of theological speculation, it is in reality modern man's perplexity expressed in symbolic terms. It is the problem I so often had to deal with in treating the neuroses of intelligent patients. It can be expressed in a more scientific psychological language. For instance, instead of using the term God, you say unconscious. Instead of Christ, self. Instead of incarnation, integration of the unconscious. Instead of salvation or redemption, individuation. Instead of crucifixion or sacrifice on the cross, realization of the four functions or of wholeness. I think it is no disadvantage to religious tradition if we can see how far it can coincides with psychological experience. On the contrary, it seems to me a most welcome aid in understanding religious traditions. And I certainly found that to be true. Um, and so when we're talking about um, mass relations or the collective unconscious, um, you know, the, the God image that Ed, Edward Edinger is referring to is um, the God within you, the, the self which really controls your life. And boy, oh boy, have I ever experienced that in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And, and the, it means that the collective unconscious is really it is God in this context. What I would say further is that there is something more even than that. And, and that's the mystery that um, we can never get to the bottom of. And, and so, you know, you can you can say what you like, but, you know, it's pretty clear that, um, you know, the, the collective unconscious can get within it certain cockamamie ideas. Uh, for example, 
uh, January 6th is a good example of a cockamamie idea that came up from the collective unconscious. But as we see, God has mysterious ways. <laughs> and, and even in the, on that day said, no, <laughs> you know, it ain't going to be that way, guys. Sorry. <laughs> well, you know, and exactly. And when you read that, when you read that passage at the end of the you know, 10 page letter, it reminded me of the structure of Marie Louise von Franz, his engagement with a theologian. And what is interesting, I didn't realize this till just now, um, not just translating religion into psychology. He actually transliterated religion to psychological terms, except in doing so, the hidden trickster there is he took away the hand over your shamed authority to the church and chapter five of Ion, Christ is a symbol of self. He put then the onus and the responsibility and then the heartfelt life of all of that in the self back to the individual. So he basically in that sense, he, he safe cracked and kind of pink, pink Panther, you know, Peter Sellers robbing the bank. He just robbed the church and put all that back on self. So it right. wasn't just a synonym. Like when you think of God, think of unconscious, he went through that, but then at the last part, once he's done that, he's robbed you blind. You know, rob the church blind and given the power back to the self. Right. So, um, so here, uh, pound in this next sentence is really uh, covering that also co covering the same set sort of ideas. It is symbolized by an open-ended mount ending in ideal light rather than in stone. It is announced by a concluding voice that keeps celebrating the same divinely favored beginnings from the vantage point of new endings. Okay, you wanna comment on that? Yeah, that, that really, um that really embraces, encapsulates, and expresses the don't lose sight of where you came from, but don't drive forward looking back. You know, right. the, that hermit process of be, be attentive to the cave of the now. I mean, get to know right now what's happening, not what you expect to happen. But at the same time, this celebrating the same divinely favored beginnings that's yep. that's the that's the oak tree remembering itself as a seed. Yep. So um, then he goes on. Mass relations are changed by adding a new subject to the previous four phase su subject, so as to form a new four phase subject. Uh, so this is um, this is what happens. Uh, in the collective that uh, we now have seen, um, we've seen manifest, uh, you know, a part of the sickness of the collective unconscious of the, of the American um, gestalt or manifest, and um, it changes everything. Um, it, by adding this new subject, then we have to integrate it. We have to come up with a way to integrate uh, those people. And, and that is a process. It's, and we're now seeing the pre process going on. But before, many Americans were not conscious of this violent feeling that was bubbling up in so many Americans, so many of our fellow Americans. And uh, once we know, uh, we can't, you know, we can't unring the bell. We have to integrate uh, them and because they are Americans. And I recall uh, one time in a discussion where uh, some older women were really whipping up on, on patriarchal men in various ways. And I... I said, 
wait a minute, those men are the salt of the earth. And those men fought shoulder to shoulder with me in Vietnam and they kept me alive there. And, you know, they're, they're Americans too and we have to integrate them and find ways to integrate them. Um, and, you know, they are not the enemy. Um, and, well, I think uh, that brings that idea of the strobe I had earlier, frame by frame by frame, that the old adage, don't lose heart, where while that's happening, you keep frame by frame by frame pouring in clean water. I mean, it, 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 little by little, you are diluting this new poison. Little by little, you are the ablution pool. You're cleaning the system but you're doing it in real time as you go along, not taking your, the process to the mechanic to get an oil change. It's not that drastic a, or not that sudden um, of a process. And when the changes occur, those numinous sociological events, it's sudden, but it comes from that constant long-term drip, drip, consistent you know, balance of, well, add purity to the toxin, add purity to the toxin. You know, and little by little, um, it flips to where, you know, I think you, I think you may have said, or it may have been, I don't remember who said it. I think it was on a Wednesday piece where um, small amounts of poison are medicine, large amounts of medicine are poison. I mean, where little by little understanding the, that mixture, that alchemy of how to, um, how to keep a sick system fighting towards the good. Yeah, and um, and and it always has, and it always will, and, and it's an unstoppable process. And um, so, anyway, uh, we can uh, go on. Uh, where are we here? Okay, and I'll, I'll go. Um, in the first draft, which, contain, which contains evolving epitomes and prototypes for the whole poem, mass relations change by the addition of cantos. Yeah, so, so the whole poem itself evolved uh, very much so uh, during the course of writing. Um, and, uh, you know, he was, in a way, he was trying to write his own story, but he was also trying to write the story of all of us. Right. And, and, um, and you know, if, if I were to very seriously get into a study of Ezra Pound, which I have no intention of doing because I don't have the time, uh, you know, but but I'm sure that it would be worth doing in the sense that you would very soon see yourself um, in, in the passages and even in the, um, you know, even in the piece in Cantos where he's describing what, what happened to him when he slipped off the path and, and got, got himself indicted for treason um, right. and you know in the end he was never indicted he was never uh, prosecuted for treason the, the justice department dropped the indictment but only after he had certainly only after they had taken their pound of flesh by making him sit in saint elizabeth for 12 years well you know you Exactly. And then change by the addition of cantos, you know, one cantos becomes two cantos, becomes three cantos, becomes four cantos, which becomes a small work. Adding the fifth cantos becomes a sixth cantos, you know, the work plus two work. plus. So that's what's interesting there, too, is to me, the image comes into uh, if I if I designed a new library, except I'm not going to design it with the full collection. There's got to be room to grow. So it's book by book, adding book by book, that one book by book changes the library every time a new book is installed on a shelf or a new app on your phone 
or a new person you encounter in your life or a new experience you have. Right. Cantos by Cantos. Yeah. And so it's always changing just as the American collective unconscious is changing, just as the collective unconscious of the human species is changing. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I personally take hope from the idea that uh, the United States of America is the one country in the world where uh, people from every country of the world are trying to immigrate to it. Mm -hmm. And, And so it has a certain magnetism, which is mysterious. And, and yet it says that, that many uh, see a kind of answer in what it brings forth, even with the bad things that we bring forth, which are many, mm-hmm. of course, um, and well, which we're constantly in, integrating, of course. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, other countries don't integrate. You know, they, they have authoritarian rulers who say you have to believe this and nothing else. You have to dress this way and not that way, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and you know, human beings don't want to live that way. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it seems to me a scale, uh, to pull a distinction of scale out here in the process, where change by the addition of cantos, changed by the addition of drafts, going back to your Maria Prophetessa, third century alchemist, changed by the addition of cantos is one, two, three, four is a draft that becomes one. And so we add a cantos one, we add a cantos two, we add a cantos three, we add a cantos four. Now we have a draft becomes one. Then we add another cantos one, and so that to me, there's a scale there of the, the cantos being the components added and the drafts being the interrelated, interdependent set group of components at any given iteration point, mm-hmm. I think, to distinguish the scale, because I think those are both intrinsically working together, you know, from the process and sequence, the cantos are sequence and the drafts are process in a way before it becomes one. Okay, so the last sentence then, detailed expo- exposition of this unusual form, especially in the first draft, will have to await closer examination. Here, it can only be sketched and we're... I think today we spent two hours of closer examination on it. Yeah, <laughs> today we s- spent two hours on one paragraph. Right. This book and the book we've been referring to is 76, One World, uh, the Cantos, um, the Cantos of Ezra Pound. And so what what can't be denied um, is that Ezra Pound's thought throughout the 20th century um, was profound. Okay, Mm -hmm. and and from a very early age. Um, And if, you know, if you were to take the contos and, you know, equally thick, which I also purchased recently because I wanted to bring myself up to date, but this book, a companion to the contos of Ezra Pound, and and you can see how thick it is. where another author has gone through every canto and explained every reference in the cantos so that you can understand what, um, what he means uh, or she means. I'm not sure if it's a man or woman because the name is Carol. Uh, it might be a man, uh, but let me see if I can find an example. Um, because I had read earlier the uh, 81. So let me see if I can get to that. It might be difficult because it's, it's so, to find it in short order is not necessarily the easiest thing. I'm up to Canto 75. Um, 
Well, while you're looking for that too, I think in theme with, you know, 76, 1776, the, the Declaration of Independence finished July 2nd, 1776. It signed, dated July 4th, 1776. So we celebrate our freedom and independence on July 4th based on that 1776 date, but we were continuing to fight until 1783. So it's interesting to me, the cantos of the iterations of the dates, uh, some of the, you know, some of the people signing the constitution were thinking it should have been on July 2nd is when the date should have been, but then it was July 4th dated, but then that wasn't the end. That was just the statement of, okay, here we go. And 1783 was the actual, we had our independence. Right. Uh, so let me, I'll just give a short example of what's in this book, Companion. Uh, and I'm referring to uh, Canto 81. And uh, it, it basically provides a glossary of every reference in, in the Cantos, which is nearly 11,000 references. But uh, it goes through and lists each one. So, for example, uh, Zeus bosom or the bosom of Zeus. And then it's explained as divine power abides in the nature, in nature and manifests itself through the green world of Ceres, Demeter, the goddess of corn, the harvest and fruitfulness. And so just that one, you can see. Um, how complex it is and um, well, especially with series there i mean and not just even the the goddess of agriculture i mean corn wheat uh, barley she's one of the sacred sisters of the temple also so you can right. extend that to then vesta and wara and the three fate the three fates um right. and then um the third thing cythera C-Y-T-H-E-R-A, that's a word he used. And it's defined here as Aphrodite, the planet Venus. Well, how many of us know that, I mean, this is the first time I knew that there is such a word as Cythera, <laughs> let alone that it refers to Aphrodite and the planet Venus. And um, well, and that would be, I think if I'm, if I'm remembering remembering correctly, mythologically, then that was when she, um, when you get the Venusian or the Venus associated with uh, Sibel, or then, um, which is different than the Sibyls. But um, okay, there's then. a whole whole group of names. I mean, Melusina, uh, Cythera, that are often, I think, attributed to be an individual, but they're actually representations of one of the existing um, goddesses there. Right, and so there's three more that I wanna do and then we'll quit, but uh, one is Dolores, and then the reference is perhaps the girl who told Young Pound to eat bread in 1907. Mm -hmm. And then the next reference, come pan. And the it says, uh, Eat bread, boy, a recurrent phrase in the content. So that was some incident that I'm not aware of. But I and that saying, sounds like a prison statement. Like that's all he had to eat. Eat bread, boy. Eat bread. Right. And then the, the very next reference, Sergeant, perhaps the girl in Sergeant's 1891 painting, La Carmenchita, is Dolores. Uh, so you can mm. see how complex this is. And so the point I would make is that if a young man <laughs> younger than me <laughs> were to pick up this book, The Companion to the Contos and the Contos and read them through once, it is a, the equivalent of a liberal arts education, basically. Mm -hmm. That's and right. I it is. And um, I think also, too, he found his brain worked exquisitely fast. I yeah. mean, he he could put together. I mean, it's just ad lib off the cuff, ad lib off the cuff. And 
part of that was he was, you know, he surfed his own. He knew what his gig was. So he didn't, he wasn't apologizing. He was living the process. But what's interesting is the cantos then give him the opportunity to just gatling gun four or five non sequiturs right together as a single Jungian paragraph idea. Yeah. You know, is so each cantos allows because <clears throat> if if you were in conversation, I mean, I would love to talk to him. I mean, I, I think I'd just dance around, but um, yeah. I think typically that loses a lot of people if you go three cantos in a row in a conversation. People are like, "What are you doing?" And you lost me at like the half of the first one. I mean, so I think the cantos are a perfect form for his non sequitur way of thinking, or these draft after draft after cantos after cantos. He was always on the move and wasn't, you know, beholden to anything he'd done in the past. But again, singing the sacred seeds of the beginnings, he didn't lose sight of, you know, what's the mission. Okay, so let me, I'll, I'll just read the part um, where this Dolores comes up uh, at the beginning of uh, Cantor number 81. And Dolores said, Come, pan, nino, eat bread, my lad. Uh, eat bread, me lad. Sergeant had painted her before he descended, i.e., if he descended, but in those days he did thumb sketches, impressions of the Valaquez in the Museo del Prado, and books cost a peseta, brass candlesticks in proportion hot wind came from the marshes and death chill from the mountains. So, you know, you, you very quickly see that this is a very erudite uh, set of poems. And if you were to read them and then use the companion to understand all the relations. My God, imagine how you'd how you'd be at cocktail parties. <laughs> well, I, you know, <clears throat> yes, and at the same time, I think that he's able to, I think, address history with historical friends. I mean, time is of no consequence to him. He, for example, the conversation today, we have Jung, and we have. Marie-Louise von France and a couple of theologians, and then you and me, and we have Pound, and we have Maria Prophetessa from the third century. And I mean... It, and Ray Green the, and Penny Dewar. And Ray Green and Penny Dewar. And <laughs> the thing about that is that then that's a that's a nice dinner party. I mean, yeah. who, that we kind of had in throwing you and I and the YouTube audience here. So it's interesting. That's kind of a Ezra Pound... He, I think he dismissed time because he was always active. He didn't have to really worry about what time it was. He wanted, what are my resources? Okay, from 1436, or actually 1538 instead of 1776. And um, it's interesting that then that missing component of time, frankly, makes for a pretty, pretty damn good time. Yeah. Like, yeah. Well, um, so let me just make one favorite comment, which is, uh, someone who was derisive about the education at Hamilton College, of which both Ezra and I are graduates, once said in response to what is the, what is the value of a liberal arts education, they said to make you interesting at cocktail parties. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a der derisive way of putting it. But, um, you know, the reality is that what it is, is teaching you how to learn. If you, mm -hmm. if you go get a liberal arts education, you're going to learn how to learn. Right. And, uh, you know, would that I had time, I would definitely read the, all the contos and all the references myself but i i have other fish to fry so i probably won't get around to doing that but you know you know point, i agree i i think before you get to that point yeah i just kind of eaching them it's like open up and read one and then close it put it back on the shelf you yeah. know just touch base with it every once in a while yeah and so uh so the liberal arts education teaches one to learn how to learn. 
basically. Mm -hmm. And that's quite different from the logo style of education that an engineer gets, where you have to learn this specific thing and no other, and you right. have to be tested on this specific thing and no other. And the problem with that is you might at the end of it, get a certification and a degree, but uh, you won't know a damn thing about what, what you need to know in order to do the next thing in your career. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> because you're, you're basically changing creating, so fast. Yeah. You're creating endings <clears throat> before you start instead of experiencing the process to get to the natural ends. Right. And so this is Marie Louise von Franz's point that, that everything that is fixed like, uh, uh, sacred books are, you know, exactly that fixed. And the point of what we're talking about is that what we're talking about is something that is alive. And mm -hmm. obviously the collective unconscious is alive and it, it has meaning and, and we need to try to understand that. Yeah. And instead of a staid static, boring we have a fluid fluency forward yeah and um well i i think i should get off my soapbox here for now nice. uh, <laughs> your feet <okay>. are clean <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you've so, been on soapbox long enough your feet are now clean <laughs> right. so let's just remind everyone that we will not be doing this next sunday uh, as I will be in recovery from my surgery. And uh, we'll see when we can begin again, because uh, mm -hmm. obviously I have to sit here for two hours if I'm uh, going to have the, these area day conversations <laughs> with Jordan. <laughs> and and uh, my recovery from uh, hip replacement may indeed uh, militate against me sitting for that long. Well, and I have to say too, Skip, you do know the erudite is an erudite word. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't hurt to ask people to look it up. Um, nope, not at all. Not know, at all. I, I, so we're... Uh, at at the end of high school, I I won a couple of awards, and one of them was uh, Webster's Dictionary, <clears throat> and. Um, you know, ultimately, I gave that dictionary away because we now can punch words into the Internet and get definitions easily. But um, but I thoroughly use that di dictionary. I used it all the time. And uh, it's it's valuable to understand what's there. And so. Anyway. So this next week, this next Sunday, we won't be here, but we will be adding the cantos of hip replacement <laughs> yeah. to, to, to the space that'll between be good. the next segment. <laughs> yep, that'll be good. And so there will be a class tomorrow uh, evening. Uh, we're talking about uh, two essays on analytical psychology in the Monday night class. And on Wednesday, we will be having a class on um, chapter five. This is my favorite chapter of uh, alchemy, uh, which contains that particular exchange that we read here. Right. Um, and so we will be having that class. Um, and then um, Thursday is my big day. So um, that's going to be a tremendous birthday present for me uh, hopefully it will add to my mobility quite a lot yep. and, and as we're in the season of skip's birthday <laughs> right oh and uh for those of you who don't know it's my 75th so it's a non-trivial birthday <laughs> <laughs> sort of a milestone in, in life and mm -hmm. um so anyway, um, thank you so much, Jordan, for uh, you too. bearing with me. And uh, we'll, we'll find a time to begin this again in the future. Uh, but, best of uh, to the Cantos. I know I'll see you tomorrow evening and Wednesday, but best to the uh, Cantos of hip replacement. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm sure it'll be great. Uh, so 
I'm very confident. I, that's one thing I always say to my surgeon right before I go out. I say to my anesthesiologist and, and my surgeon, I'm very confident uh, because, you know, that means I plan to wake up from this. Yeah, uh, definitely. This thing. And, uh, we'll anyway. go in with bright eyes, you know, and uh, <laughs> well, you, 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 tend to, you go in with bright eyes and you tend to see more. So, yeah. and you come out the other side. So anyway. Peace, everyone. Thank you so much for being here.